Good day gamers, this is The Game Guy, and today we're going to talk about the Hammer of the Scots Enhanced. It's a, um, a variant of Hammer of the Scots by Columbia Games with new rules, new maps, and uh, playing pieces, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, let's begin. We'll start with the game board itself. Now this is the original game board from Columbia Games, but I've made a few modifications to it. On the North Sea side, I've divided it into five zones, sea zones, and then also five zones on the Irish Sea side. Now on the North Sea side, you'll see that this line is a continuation of this boundary between these two territories. This line right here bisects this singular territory this line is a continuation of an existing line, and also this is a continuation of an existing line. And I did something similar on the Irish Sea side. You can see the continuation of the line here, continuation of the line here into another zone. Both of these islands are, are on this side of the zone. There's a continuation of this line right up here, and then finally a continuation of this line. So those are the sea zones for now, the, the original game. map is somewhat flimsy. It's beautifully rendered, but it is paper, so it's prone to ripping. To make this a little stronger, I had a custom piece of acrylic cut for this game. And so I attached it to the front side in case anybody spills drinks or anything. It'll protect the plane surface. And then on the underside, I used a large amount of masking tape to make it nice and strong. Um, and for purposes of both adhering to it as well as protecting the underside. So this is the only modification I've done to the original in board. In addition to the original board, there are some additional maps that I made. One is the battle board. And zoom in on it here. This uh, will look very similar to those who have played Axis and Allies. It's, a, um, it's a, a, an attack side over here and then a defense side over on this side. The attack has four different levels, one, two, three, four. And then the defending side is uh, alphabetical in nature. So A, B, C, and D. So those are the, this is the battle board and I'll uh, explain this more as the game This progresses. is an additional map, the economic production board, which also tracks weapons and political development. For game purposes, this map is considered identical to the main board. So any pieces that are put on this board are considered as if they're on the main board and vice versa. Most of the action takes place on the main board, but like I say, where needed, the spillover board is very handy if you have such a large army that you can't fit all in one I space. have been known to enjoy some whiskey in my time, so this satchel from Crown Royal was very helpful in holding the currency. Now, for the, the actual currency, I used reproduction pennies from the time of Edward I, Edward II of England. And uh, you can see this is the stash of pennies right here. There are 66 pennies in total. The next thing are two copies of the actual rules. The reason I printed two copies is I thought it would be handy for each player to be able to have access to one at the same time for any rule clarifications or something of the sort. These, along with the other maps, are available for download from this website. And finally, I have a plastic container that contains the actual game pieces. And then I have a large chest. Well, it's a medium-sized chest to contain all the different things from the game other than the main board plastic itself. Plastic section, I tried to label everything appropriately, and I'll show you uh, a detail of what's in here. I have a Scottish flag on one side and an English flag on the other. This is something I printed off and then laminated. Made a number of these, and these are uh, the territory markers for the, the different sides, both England and Scotland. Here are the boats that are applicable to both teams. Now it's a, um, an undifferentiated chip. So when you are placing the board, placing the boat on the board, you'll simply put a marker next to it to show whether it is English or in fact Scottish. The blue are for Scotland, the red is for England. And then from there, each section contains different things. Here are the Scottish infantry, English infantry, the English and Scottish archers both. The English knights, including the Welsh. And then up here you have the, the start of the nobles with their respective heraldry. More nobles, more nobles, more nobles. In this section you have the Scottish king, the English king, William Wallace, the Norse, and the French knight. And then there are nobles in the center section. For the game pieces themselves, I actually used a combination of two different games. The base is the original from Hammer of the Scots. 
the sticker, which I ordered two of, so I could put the sticker on each side, and then the base itself. And then the top portion is from a game called Feudal, which was produced by 3M, I believe in 1967. And I always thought the craftsmanship or the, the sculptures uh, for that game were very high quality for the time. And they're really cheap to find on eBay. So I bought uh, some copies of those sets and then mounted those on top of the base. Game pieces that are blue are those that favor Scotland. And those that are red, red bases, favor England or else are allied with England. For example, John Balliol is a supporter of England. So his, his uh, troops have red. And then Robert the Bruce, uh, depending on the scenario, can be red or blue. I also wanted to point out a little bit of fun that I had. I noticed that the Scottish nobles uh, had one more than the English nobles to start. And so I thought it would be appropriate to create one more English noble. And I took the liberty of infusing my family into this game. This is my actual heraldry from the Queen. Uh, granted from the Canadian Heraldic Authority. And so I used it to uh, create this game piece. So this is a Pennington Noble. It is an anachronistic uh, heraldry since we were only granted it from the crown uh, in 2012. But I had some fun in making this piece for the game. I also wanted to draw your attention to the coloring of the various pieces because it does mean something. Game pieces that are lighter in color are easier to bribe. So for example, the lighter the color, the easier it is to convert to your side if you're trying to bribe a noble from the opposing side. So these are the easiest nobles to bribe in terms of uh, the, the role that you have to get in order for them to convert to your side. These are medium, and these that are dark, these are actually ones that cannot be bribed. So both Moray and Pennington are considered so fanatical that they are unable to be bribed to the other side. The reason that I used the different color schemes was just to make it easier to visually identify which nobles are easier to bribe so that you can more efficiently use your resources as opposed to having to look it up in the rule book each time. There are actually two different scenarios within the game. Now the victory conditions differ, but the actual gameplay is very similar between the two. One game is called The Bruce, and the other is called Braveheart. Similar to the original by Columbia Games, there are two scenarios, like I mentioned. There's The Braveheart and The Bruce. The Braveheart starts in the year 1297, and The Bruce scenario starts in the year 1306. Both are fun and have slightly different objectives. To win The Braveheart scenario, the English can either achieve a military victory by killing the Scottish King John Balliol once he arrives in 1299, the English can achieve an economic victory instead by generating 34 pennies of income at the end of the English term. Conversely, for Braveheart, the Scots can win by achieving a military victory by killing the English King Edward I or Edward II, depending on who's alive, or by surviving until the end of 1314. Or the, the second way that the Scots can win is they can achieve an economic victory by generating 34 pennies of income at the end of a Scottish turn. Now the second game, the Bruce game, has slightly different victory conditions. For the English, they can achieve a military victory by killing Robert the Bruce, or they can achieve an economic victory by generating 34 pennies of income at the end of an English turn. A third way that the English can win is they can achieve a political victory by having John Common anointed as the King of Scotland. This requires allegiance from 75% of the current nobles that are alive, barring Pennington, while simultaneously John Common is at the territory of Fife in the English victory conditions phase. Now the Scots have three possible options that they can use to win the game in the Bruce. The first is they can achieve a military victory by killing English King Edward I or Edward II, depending on who's alive, or by surviving until the end of 1314. They can achieve an economic victory by generating 34 pennies of income at the end of the Scottish turn, or they can achieve a political victory by having Robert the Bruce anointed as King of Scotland. This requires allegiance from 75% of the currently surviving nobles, barring, barring Pennington, while simultaneously Robert the Bruce is at the Territory of Fife at the end of the year. The Territory of Fife is, of course, where the Stone of Schoon is, so that uh, that is uh, the prerequisite for being crowned the King of Scotland. Another color distinction I should mention are the knights that support England. You see the dark color here that's by York, and then the much lighter color by both Wales and Ulster. And the reason is the dark knights of England uh, that, that support England, they will always fight for England in any battle. They will always fight for England. 
However, both Wales and Ulster, being Celtic in nature, will not necessarily always fight against the Scots. So you have to make a roll each time they are engaged in battle to see, if, to see whether they stay and actually engage the enemy or else flee the field of battle without fighting. So this is the scenario for Braveheart. This is how the board game should be set up. And I just want to draw your attention to a few things. So let's draw your attention to a few things. First, we've got the year of the, the of the game. The game starts in the year 1297. This marker, this blank piece, always marks the year of the board. At the end of every round, that piece will be advanced, and it will start the next year. And you'll see in the year 1299, we've already set it up here, John Balliol will return from France along with the French knight. They will come aboard this transport uh, ship, which is a Scottish ship, and will be available for the Scottish player to uh, uh, deploy troops and, and move uh, units from different parts of the board using the ship. And then you see in 1301, there will be a Viking attack, and the Scottish player can wield that as the rules outline. You'll also see here as we pan over the game board that all the territories at the beginning of the Braveheart scenario are loyal to John Balliol. So all the nobles, the ones that have their own individual heraldry, all the Scottish nobles, they are all loyal to John Balliol. You'll also see William Wallace. The William Wallace character is here. There's some infantry troops supporting him in the territory of Fife. Each territory that is worth a numeric value has that value at the top of that territory by the name. Like for example, Angus right here, that's a territory that is worth two production points, economic production points. In contrast, the territory right next to it, Mar, is worth just one. The most valuable is down here, Lenark, excuse me, Mentieth. Uh, that's a three-point territory right here. Now, as you read the rules themselves, you'll find that each noble is uh, identified in the rules as to where they, where he should start, along with the troop placement for the beginning of the game. But what's important here for the time being is just to recognize that every territory that's in Scotland that has a numeric value, has some economic production on it, is uh, has a, a flag that is showing loyalty to Scotland, and all the nobles, once again, are loyal to King John Balliol. In contrast, down in England, you have King Edward himself, that's Edward I, so that's Longshanks, the Pennington Noble is next to him. You have different knights. Now, these are not knights with individual heraldry, so they are not nobles. The only noble in the beginning of this game on England is Pennington. The rest of these are knights that are uh, in the employ of England. You have uh, the Welsh knight right here. You have a, a, an English archer, and then you have infantry supporting the English cause. So all started in England and you'll see a corresponding English flag on the English section. At the beginning of the Braveheart scenario, you'll see that England has an economic production of five, and Scotland begins the game at an economic production of 32. And also, none of these weapons or political developments at the beginning of the game have any flags on it. Another them. important element to remember is that not all territories can produce new units, so therefore some territories have more strategic value than For others. For example, the land of England has vast resources and it can always produce new units on it. But there are only three Scottish territories that can produce new units. These are Lennox, Fife, and up in the north, Strathsbury. Here's a full picture of Strathsbury with the flag not covering. Now each year in this game consists of 13 different phases and all 13 together complete one year. And as you can see in, in this game, uh, once again, the Braveheart phase starts at 1297 and it ends in 1305. So for the 13 phases, that sounds really daunting. 13, that's a pretty large number for a strategy game. But here's the deal. It actually is pretty intuitive, and a lot of these phases uh, you can skip. You just have to do a quick check to see if, the, um, if they apply, but often they don't. Here's what I mean. The first phase is the year adjustment phase, and that's no more complicated than moving the marker ahead each year. 
the exception is the very beginning of the game because we start off in the year 1297 for this scenario. So that is all there is to the year adjustment phase. The second phase is the required scripted action phase. A lot of years don't have required scripted actions, uh, but you have to do a quick check with the rule book to see if um, a particular year has a required scripted action. And if so, you literally just follow what the script says and do what it says. The third phase is the noble return phase. Now this is something that is unique to this game, at least I've never encountered it in another strategy game, and I think it's a, a, a clever innovation if I may say so. It has to do with the nobility. In the nobility within this game, you can have someone that is killed, you can have a noble killed, but he will be replaced by his heir a few years hence of that. And, and the thinking is when a noble who's entrenched is, is killed in action, um, his heir will take a few years to come into his own as his own noble and make his own actions on behalf of his noble house. So this game reflects that when a noble is killed, they, they do go into a holding pattern and then uh, in subsequent turns, three turns, three full turns subsequent to the death of the previous noble, the heir surfaces. So this is all accomplished in the noble return phase each round. Next, we start to get into the actual English specific uh, actions. And so phase four is the English movement phase. This is followed by the fifth, which is the English battle phase. The sixth phase is the English economic production phase. The seventh is the English spending and deployment phase. Eighth, is the English victory conditions check phase. And then this in turn is followed by the Scottish portions of the game. And so the, the ninth phase is the Scottish movement phase, marrying the earlier English movement phase. The 10th phase is the Scottish battle phase. The 11th is the Scottish economic production phase. The 12th is the Scottish spending and deployment phase. And finally, the 13th and final phase is the Scottish Victory Conditions Check Phase. I think it might be helpful to illustrate the actual phases to get a better understanding of what they mean. So in this case, being that we're starting the game for the Braveheart, the year adjustment phase, phase one, is not necessary. So we don't have to move anything forward just on this very first turn. The next is the required scripted actions phase. And in this case, in the Braveheart scenario, there is a required scripted action for the year 1297, the start of the game. So Edward I is required to take a one die and make a one-time roll. This is just in the Braveheart scenario, the beginning of the game. So in this case, I rolled a five. So the English king receives 65 pennies. That's a very favorable start to the game. So the English king receives 65 pennies. If he'd instead rolled a three or a four, that would result in 55 pennies and then a roll of one or two receives only 50 pennies. So I've counted out 65 pennies based on my roll. And so the English player, and this is a one-time thing for this scenario, the English player must use all of this money to try to bribe as many Scottish nobles to the English cause as the possible. The thing about bribery are certain nobles are easier to bribe than others. Now you might recall me mentioning earlier that the lighter colored nobles are easier to bribe. Those can be converted to the to the side that's trying to bribe them. If the person trying to bribe them rolls a four, five, or a six. In contrast, those that are darker nobles uh, may be bribed with a roll of five or six. You, so you can see it's a little harder. And then there are some hardcore nobles that cannot be converted at all. In this example, um, Common and Bruce both cannot be bribed at all in this scenario. Although the Bruce Noble will convert to supporting England later in the game through a required scripted action and then uh, convert again back to Scotland under another required script action. And this reflects the historical Bruce and his proclivity to flip-flop. Now what makes bribery interesting in this game is you have to declare how many bribery attempts you're going to use for each noble prior to making any rolls. So this forces you to give some thought as to the probability of a conversion, and it also creates the possibility of you overpaying for a noble. So that creates its own interesting dynamic.
For example, let's say I'm going to try to convert Argyle to my cause. Now, you might remember that Argyle is an easier noble to, to bribe, and a bribery of four, five, or six, a successful roll, will convert Argyle to my side. So, being that I have 65 pennies um, as the English king, let's say I'm going to use 10 of these and make two bribery attempts. Each bribery attempt costs five pennies, and that's always the case. Well, that's always the case unless you have papal support, which is a uh, weapons or political development that we'll talk about later. So in this case, I would set aside 10 pennies and declare that I'm putting the 10 pennies towards the attempted bribery of Argyle. And then I would use the rest of my pennies to allocate to trying to bribe other nobles. And I have to declare all the pennies that I'm going to put towards each specific noble prior to the, the attempted roll. I made a decision as to how I want to allocate my potential, my potential bribery. I'm going to put 10 towards trying to bribe Galloway. I'm going to put 25, which is a very aggressive roll, towards trying to, um, to bribe Dunbar. I've put just five towards trying to bribe Angus, so clearly I don't consider that a very high strategic value. I've put 20 but towards trying to bribe Ross, and I've put 10 towards trying to bribe Argyle. So keep in mind, each bribery attempt is five pennies. So down here, this will be two attempts that I'll have to, to uh, bribe the Galloway, two for Argyle, four for Ross, one for Angus, and then uh, five for Dunbar. So that's how the bribery allocation works. Now I'm ready to make some rolls. Galloway is one that uh, requires a five or six for me to successfully bribe him. So I have two that I've rolled towards him. And hey, it looks like I overpaid, but on my very first roll, I converted Galloway, so he is going to convert to the English cause. For Argyle, remember that it's easier to bribe Argyle because he can be uh, bribed with a four, five, or six. So here we go. I roll. My first roll is unsuccessful. My second roll is successful. So similar to the um, to the Galloway, I'm going to get a, um, a different figure and replace Argyle. Here's the Argyle supporting the English. So it will go on this territory, the Scottish supporting Argyle will be removed, the flag will be converted, and most importantly, the Argyle, the land of Argyle, territory of Argyle, has an economic production value of two, so this will immediately make the English uh, go up by two to eight, and the Scottish flag will be reduced to 29. To save time here, I'm gonna go ahead and let you know that uh, I made some rolls and the Dunbar noble converted to England side, so there was a corresponding adjustment of two uh, for economic production. Angus, with uh, only one bribery attempt, did not convert, so he stays loyal to the uh, Scottish cause. Ross also converted, so uh, his economic production of the land of Ross, the territory of Ross, is one. So, based on that, the English now stand at 11 economic production points and the Scottish at 26. It's the required scripted action phase. Uh, the, the beginning of, of the Braveheart scenario, the required script and action phase is, is one of the longest required script and action phases of the game. So that uh, was a little bit long, but I think you got the idea. You can also see that the English player now has some English um, some nobles that are now loyal to the English cause. And that really changes the flavor of the dynamic. So we're ready to move forward to the next phase. The third phase is the noble return phase. Now, in this case, there are no nobles that have, uh, that have died in gameplay. So we can go ahead and skip this phase. Moving on to phase four, it's now the English movement phase. Now let's talk about move rating. The move rating is on the lower left-hand uh, side of every base of the figures. So in this case, Galloway's move rating is a two. You see it in the lower left-hand corner. The first has a move rating of three. See it in the lower left-hand corner. That's his move rating. Now, move ratings in this game um, really represent how well a, a piece can move over a particular territory. Now, reflecting the real land of Britain, there are some territories that are more easily navigable, 
and the this re is represented by the green lines in this game. So a green line costs a movement of only one to, to, to get through. In contrast, rougher terrain is noted by the red lines. So for example, uh, the, the red lines require a movement of two to get across. So in order for Galloway to get to Garrick, uh, Carrick, it, he'll, he'll be required to spend both of his movement points. And it is now the English movement phase. So if I wanted him to move forward, it would cost both, uh, both of his move points in order to get to the land of Carrick. But let's say in contrast, he was over here in Edinburgh, and let's say for a moment that Mentieth is not there. So he could, if he was here, see how there's a green line here and a green line here. So he could move one, two on the same turn because of the two green lines to pass. But if he was trying to move into Selkirk Forest, he could only move one because of the red line. So that's how movement works. You can works. move every piece, every turn, for the maximum amount of their movement, if you wish, but you are not required to move all of your pieces. Keep in mind that all movement must be done before you move to the next phase, which is the English battle phase. So in this case, just to keep it easy, let me say that the English are going to move on multiple fronts. Let's say three of these are gonna move into the territory of Anon, and then the rest of the English are going to move into uh, this territory of Teviot. We'll just have them all in there for, for, the, for simplicity's sake. And then let's say I wanted to also have uh, Argyle move. He has a move rating of two and wanted him to move and attack La, uh, La Cabre, uh, which is unguarded. So being that it is unguarded, that immediately results in the flag uh, being flipped to the English. Uh, La Cabre is a, a economic production of one. So we will reduce uh, Scotland once again by one to 25, increase England to 12. Let's say that this was all that I wanted the English to move this turn. Now keep in mind, I can move all of my pieces for the English at the same time on the same turn. So just wanted to be clear about that. So even though I chose not to move all my pieces, I had that option. Now we move to the, the next phase, which is the battle phase. You'll see each figure in the game has a, a, a rating in the lower right hand side. This is C2 for this particular um, uh, infantry soldier, the, the Lindsay. And so the C represents the defensive capability and the two next to it represents the offensive capability. And you'll see each in each uh, game piece has, um, has a, a rating in the lower right-hand corner. So Galloway, for example, has a, um, an attack of two and a defense of, uh, of B. So let's, let's see how that works in, in actual game. When the English crossed into Teviot, there was no, um, no resistance. There was no opposing force. So the, the territory of Teviot is immediately converted to English uh, control. The English flag is flown and we see what the, the value of the territory is. Looks like it's a one. So we'll make the adjustment on the economic, produ uh, economic production. In contrast, in the land of Annan, the, the territory of Annan, that is con uh, contested. You see that there was the um, infantry, the soldiers of uh, Lindsay that were guarding that territory. So now we move to the battle board. And as we talked about, the, the, the rating for, the, uh, for Lindsay is a C. So we're gonna put him on, a, on the C in terms of the, the battle board. And then we're going to put each of the, um, the opposition on the other side. So you can see there's an attack rating for the Hoblers of 2. Uh, for Pennington, there's a, an attack rating of 3. And then for King Edward I, 
there's an attack rating of four. He's one of the most powerful units in the game. The uh, the Scots are not looking good here for, for their ability to defend this territory, but we'll see what happens. Now, the battle mechanic is almost identical to Axis and Allies, if you're familiar with that game. And that was certainly the inspiration for uh, for, for the battle mechanics for, for my, my version of the game. So in this case, uh, battle is considered to be simultaneous. So it really doesn't matter who goes first because uh, both the attacking and the uh, defensive side will have an opportunity to, um, to, to make their move. So in this case, let's say that the English wanted to move first as the attackers. So in, in, in this, Edward I has a rating of four. So I, in the, there's only one unit that I have in the, the four space. So I take just one die and I roll. And in this case, I got a one. So if I roll a four or less, it is considered a hit. So you, as you can see, this is considered a hit. So um, the defending player gets to choose which unit is destroyed um, when, when there's something that's hit. Now in this case, there's only one. So the Scottish player has to move Lindsay to the casualty line. So this shows that um, he has been um, destroyed, but he does get a, a parting shot because he has an opportunity to uh, to defend and, and try to do some damage. So, um, so Lindsay's going to be losing this territory, but um, he does get a shot to to defend. So he defends once again at a he's a C. So a C translates to the number three. You can see it, it's right across from it. So it, it corresponds to the number three. So, I take one die, because there's only one Lindsay, and it needs to be a blue die, excuse me. All right, and I roll, and I get a one. Now, one is obviously three or less, so that is a hit. So then the English gets to decide uh, who, which, which unit is destroyed on his side. So in this case, let's say I wanted myself to be destroyed. So as opposed to the Hobelars or King Edward, which I, I'd lose the game if I lost King Edward. Um, so anyway, so let's say I'm, I'm destroyed. So at the end of this, this battle, then both uh, Lindsay's destroyed, the Noble Pennington's destroyed, and so they're removed from the battle board. Edward I and the Hobelar are returned to the territory of Anon. We look at the um, the economic production of the territory, it's a two. So we flip the flag to England and then go to our economic production board. Once again, move England up by two and Scotland down by two. And this uh, also will give me a chance to talk about the noble return phase. Now, you remember me talking about earlier how the, the nobles in this game, they never really die out. So if you have a noble that's killed, uh, he will have heirs that will resurface in the game three years, three full years after the death of the existing noble. So in this case, the noble Pennington died. So the, the Lindsay soldier has to go back in the box. Now this unit can be rebuilt at a, at a later point if the Scottish player uh, produces that, that unit, but it doesn't happen automatically. In contrast, the, the noble the Pennington will return to the game in three full turns after after he was destroyed. And it will technically be his heir that we're return. In 1297, we will look to three full years before he returns. So one, two, third year. 